Hello there. I'm Conan O'Brien. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. I'm sitting here with a contributing editor and theater critic for Time Magazine who's written this really terrific biography of the legendary comedian Bob Hope entitled Hope. I've been waiting for a great book about Bob Hope for 30 years, and it's here. And I'm very happy to be joined by Richard Zoglin. Thanks for being here, Richard. Great to be here. Um, I, true story, and we'll just lay this on the table. I heard that a great biography of Hope had come out. I read some great reviews. I went and got it. I secluded myself and digested this book completely. Loved it. And when I was done, I thought, this guy got it right. And Hope deserved a great biography, and now he has one. So congratulations. Uh, I'm really glad that you wrote this book. And then I just sent you a, a fan letter on my 1917 yes. Underwood typewriter, and that led to us realizing that we could come together and talk about the great Bob Hope yeah. here today. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I thought, too, Bob Hope... It was funny, uh, looking over all the biographies, all the Hollywood greats, most of them have had really major biographies, sometimes two, three, four, Sinatra, Crosby, you know, Cary Grant, you name it. And right. Bob Hope had been, there had been some biographies, but nothing really, really good. And so it was a real uh, a lack there, and I sort of jumped in. Well, here's the interesting thing. Uh, you know, Bob Hope was, and I don't think people appreciate this today, but few entertainers in comedy have ever done, or probably no one has ever done, what Bob Hope did, which was a massive star in movies, radio. Right. Uh, he uh, then made the, he, he transformed into television right. successfully. Uh, there wasn't a medium, I don't think, that and he didn't conquer. Go back, he started in vaudeville. Vaudeville. He, yeah. he did Broadway theater, people don't even remember today. He was a fairly substantial Broadway star in the 30s. He moved into radio, movies, television, and all that time he was doing personal appearances you know, at a rate that no other star of his stature could maintain, and he did it into his 80s, right. so it was amazing. He was obviously, uh, for my generation, it, what's interesting is that we see a different hope. My generation grew up with this different Bob Hope. I started really seeing Bob Hope on television in the 70s and then into the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I associate it with stuff, I mean, Saturday Night Live was big at the time, SCTV, these very hip, edgy shows. Yeah. Bob Hope would do these primetime specials where he and John Forsyth were dressed as Cabbage Patch dolls with Brooke Shields <laughs> yeah. and you know, uh, not to not to uh, sound snarky, but it was not my cup of tea. It seemed, sure. it seemed old. It seemed crusty. It seemed like who's you know square. Yeah. Who's watching this? And so that's the Bob Hope that I first knew, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of generation of of people that I worked with in comedy thought of Bob Hope that way. Right. This kind of sticky joke machine, right. he's corporate, he's wearing the Texaco blazer. And then, as I really got interested in comedy, I started to see his early work in the road pictures. Right. And I was completely blown away yeah. by how effing good yeah. Bob Hope was. Yeah. Just perfect. Yeah. I grew up with those movies too. They were, they were so great. And uh, Bob Hope's, the TV work, it did get uh, very stale, pretty pretty quick. But he he was the old style of comedian. Of course, he had writers. He was he was there was no real personality in Bob Hope's co comedy. He was he was a joke machine, and he uh, he used writers. And this, of course, in the '60s when the the, the sort of stand up comedy revolution happened, and George Carlin, Richard Pryor, and so forth, Robert Klein, and everybody, you know, they wrote their own material. Their stand-up comedy was an expression of themselves or their, their political views or whatever. Bob was still doing, you're right, that sort of corporate kind of uh, impersonal stand-up. But you have to go back to see how much of an innovator he was. First of all, in stand-up comedy, I mean, I really think he invented the form, at least the form that we know it. Um, a guy getting up there and telling jokes about what was happening in the world. I mean, when he came along, he, he went on, he came on to radio in 1938. And the people who were big radio stars at the time, the comedians, were Jack Benny 
and Burns and Allen and Bergen and McCarthy, and they all did jokes about their own little world. You yes. know, uh, uh, Jack Benny was the stingy guy, and there was Rochester. Right, and, and, and he's so, got the old car. Yeah. He's got a basement with money in it. It yeah. was funny stuff, but it, it had nothing to do with the outside world. It had to do with his little world, Burns and Allen routines. Bob Hope came into that world, and he said, he, for, he hired a bunch of writers, and more writers than any other uh, radio show uh, around, and he said, look, we're going to have to, this show's going to rise or fall on the jokes, and we're going to do an opening monologue. Read the papers. Give me, you know, jokes out of the, out of the news or the politics or, or Holly, what's happening in Hollywood mm -hmm. or even Bob's own life. And, you know, this was something new. Here's a stand-up comedian making jokes about the world. And that was kind of the invention of the topical monologue, which, of course, Everybody has done since. No, the topical monologue, you know, people my generation probably thinks, well, it started with Johnny Carson. That's yeah. as far back as it goes. And it really does really, I think you're right. I think it probably starts with Bob Hope mm -hmm. uh, telling jokes. And then he became the joke teller, the yeah. MC <clears throat> for America. I think he hosted the Oscars 17 times or something. It was actually hosting or Rokosa hosting 19 times, 19 believe times. it or not. Yeah. Well, 17 well. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, uh, no, but it, it, he, I remembered he was the guy who, uh, if a, he was friends with pretty much every president. Yeah. Uh, I think not Jimmy Carter. Well, he knew Carter. I mean, he knew Carter, but yeah. there wasn't, he it, couldn't it connect. He wasn't with, as close to Carter. He wasn't as close yeah, to Carter. Sure. But pretty much every president could call in Bob Hope. Yeah. And Bob Hope would be the MC for some event. He was right. friends with them. He played golf with them. Right. And people don't realize that at the height of his popularity, he had, there's a Bob Hope comic book. Yeah. Uh, there's Bob Hope merchandise. He used to write books that were big right. bestsellers that were sort of comic, yeah. silly books that were written a lot, right. uh, probably by his gag men most right. of the time. He was the original multimedia star. We talk about branding today. He was the first really Hollywood star to figure out the power of his own brand. Yeah. So he he branched out. He wrote. He started writing memoirs when he was barely in Hollywood. He already had uh, much of a career to talk about. But he would write these memoirs or on his trips overseas, and and then he wrote a newspaper column for several years mm -hmm. for the Hearst Syndicate. He had this comic book, and of course, then the golf tournament. So he was the Bob Hope brand. How many um, how many Stars had a, had their own logo, you know that little, little you know profile with the nose and the chin. The, Everybody yeah, recognized it. The iconic yeah. sloped nose, and yeah. uh, you know Jerry Lewis later, I guess, had that in the in the fifties. The, the Jerry and, Lewis. and Jerry Lewis into his nineties, I think, still uses that same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one when he was uh, twenty, the same logo. I'll use my logo forever. Uh, <laughs> the hair, yeah, which by now is just you know polyurethane. <laughs> but what's Interesting, uh, there's so many things interesting about Bob Hope, but he did use writers, he valued writers, and he would talk about his writers right. in, as part of his act. You know, right. and I need to pay my writers more, and I right. keep my jokes in a joke file. And right. th there was a, it became part of his personality was, a, was that he had writers. And I think that contrasted him, I don't know if you agree with this, but you think about the singers of the 30s and 40s and 50s, they sang standards that were written by other people. Exactly. Then uh, the Beatles and Bob Dylan, and there's this whole movement that comes along where people write their own songs right. because that's the truth. Right. And there almost feels like there's a little bit of a bias that the later stand-ups who wrote their own material mm -hmm. might, I don't know, I don't want to say they look down on, but maybe feel separated from a guy who's reading someone else's right. jokes. They feel that they're not in the same business, sort of, and that their, their comedy is more personal and, and more sincere and, and committed, sort of. Yeah. And that may be true, but Bob Hope did, but the, the comparison with singers is, is exactly right. Because uh, do we say that Frank Sinatra was not a great artist because he didn't write his own songs? No, mm -hmm. he was a great interpreter. Bob Hope didn't write those jokes, but he, he picked the jokes. He put them in the right order. He, he sometimes edited them. Mm -hmm. he, he would edit to the, you know, he would take out every excess word and he knew how to deliver them. And that's a, a huge talent too. He is uh, one of, if not the, maybe the smoothest performer, he's so exact, he's so good, 
you look at him, especially uh, in those, uh, in, in the early movies, you look at him in the 30s and throughout the 40s and into the 50s, and he is so graceful, and his yes. timing is impeccable. Yes. And it took me a while to see it. I remembered years ago uh, hearing that Woody Allen said, oh, I, I took so much from Bob Hope. Yeah. Now that didn't make sense to me right. when I first heard it because I was thinking of the Bob Hope of 1986, you mm -hmm. know, and what does he have to do with Woody Allen? Yeah. I, don't, what did you t I couldn't understand what Woody Allen could have possibly borrowed from Bob Hope. You go back and you look at the old movies and you look at his performances and Bob Hope had invented this guy yeah. who's back on his heels, right. nervous, talking, right. uh, a coward, yeah. but uh, wisecracking, right. but also trying not to offend and right. trying to get out of a jam right. and uh, trying to just kind of, and then you think, wait, these are all, yeah. these are also Woody Allen mannerisms. Yes. The, the whole, the whole uh, Woody Allen in Annie Hall tearing up the parking, the, the ticket, yeah. it's, <laughs> I don't do well with authority. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not you, don't take it personally. It is all, exactly. it's the Jewish version, <laughs> the Jewish American comics version of Bob Hope. Yeah. Yeah, that was the character that he discovered, sort of, uh, it started in 1939 with the film The Cat and the Canary, mm -hmm. comedy haunted house film. And Bob is one of a bunch of relatives and, you know, reading of a will, there's weird things going on in the house and Bob is the nervous relative and, uh, and someone says to him, don't big, big empty houses uh, scare you? He says, not me, I was in vaudeville. <laughs> uh, but that was, the, yeah. that was the start of it. And then he just developed that character in every kind of movie, service comedies and, and in you know, uh, 18th century romantic comedies. Uh, he was always that guy in any situation. Almost, almost anyone, yeah. Uh, you know, I should take us back because there's a lot of things that people don't appreciate about Bob Hope. I mean, he was a massive star and I think one of the great comedy performers of all time. Mm -hmm. um, what people don't know is that he wasn't, he was an immigrant. He was not born yeah. in the United States, born in Wales. No, born in, uh, in England, just in uh, England. outside of London. Okay, in his, England. Okay. His mother, I think, was Welsh. That's and, it. And, okay. Yeah, and the family, he lived there uh, only till four and a half is when the family emigrated. His father was a stonemason, uh, not a very good provider, alcoholic, um, you know, in and out of jobs, moved the family around a lot. They moved around in England, they were in several different towns until finally his father moved to America to look for work, moved to Cleveland, uh, brought the family over. Bob grew up in Cleveland. And poor, grew up poor, yeah. yeah. Uh, father still wasn't making a very good living. The, the mother, uh, who was very resourceful, rented out rooms in their house, uh, had boarders. All the boys, there were seven boys in the family. Bob was fifth of seven. And each boy, you know, each kid had to go to work to help the family out. And it was a tough immigrant neighborhood, you know, um, on the east side of Cleveland. And, uh, you know, tough. Bob didn't, uh, didn't graduate high school. Uh, May have uh, done some time in reform school. He did. That's the one, one of the things I discovered in the book. Bob was always vague about why he dropped out of high school, you know, wanted to get into show business. But he, he never revealed that he, he, was, uh, he was sent to reform school. He was arrested for something. The, the, the um, arrest records have been removed, I wonder by who. Uh, but I kind of assume it was shoplifting or something. He used to joke about shoplifting sporting goods when he was a kid. And he spent two stints in reform school. They released him and then he broke parole and he sent back. So, uh, and he, you know, that was the end of his schooling. It's kind of funny that he never mentioned it. You know, it seems like he liked to joke about his uh, scrappy ch Cleveland childhood. I don't know what's so so terrible about spending some time in reform school. Yeah. But he, he didn't, he, he wiped that out. Maybe of not good for fire. the brand. Maybe as not, as say. maybe not. But He was a boxer. He boxed under the name Packy East, didn't yes. he? And, and uh, we're talking about a very poor guy who's really trying to make it yeah. and trying everything. And one of the things that really comes across in your book that startled me is how long it took Bob Hope to make it, right. to really catch on. You just, he's so good and he lights up the screen and he's so talented and charismatic and then you realize that he tried and tried and tried and tried, and you know it took him forever to get a career going in vaudeville. Mm -hmm. 
He had he spent go seven, ahead. Uh, eight, nine years in vaudeville. He started out uh, with various partners. He would do a dance. He was kind of a song and dance and comedy guy. And he had a, part, a couple of different partners. They did pretty well, you know, he traveled around the Midwest, small time circuit. And, and then he broke off and tried to, on his own. And he, he started working as an MC. And that's where he kind of developed his comedy style because most of the comedians, all the comedians in vaudeville, had their routines. You know, they were the funny Irishman or the, right. you know, uh, and they would take that, that same routine from city to city. Bob was an MC and he had to kind of ad lib, improvise on stage, you know, introduce the acts, stretch the show, cut, you know, whatever, you know, fill the time. And so he had to, you know, he would throw in jokes and he would, you know, vary it from night to night. And mm -hmm. that's where he got a more conversational sort of comedy style. It was not that common in vaudeville. Uh, but he, he worked his way up. He was eventually playing the Palace Theater, the big, you know, vaudeville theater, but he still, you know, wasn't making it. He had a screen test in Hollywood in 1930 and he failed it. He yeah, I, I read that in the book and it surprised me. I, I, I don't know. He, he, he puts it down. He says, I, you know, he couldn't stand it. Um, but what, for whatever reason, they didn't think he would work. He was a bit of a, on, on screen, he was a very sophisticated New York, you know, a Broadway type. Um, and he, he was different. Uh, and I just, I think he was maybe a little too brittle and sophisticated for, for Hollywood at that time. So he went back to, then he, you know, continued to work in vaudeville and mo moved his way, he worked his way up. But it was finally after about eight or nine years, he broke into Broadway and he got a lead, uh, one of the leading roles in a Broadway show. His big show was Roberta in 1933. Mm -hmm. um, the song that's thanks for the memories. Uh, no, that, that was that was that came later in the movies. The big song from uh, Roberta was "Smoke It's in Your Eyes," which was sung to Bob Hope. Mm. <laughs> he didn't sing it, but he. Um, thanks for the memory came in 1938 when he he spent five years on Broadway and then finally uh, Paramount Pictures gave him a, a, a contract and lured him out to Hollywood, even though he kept claiming he didn't want anything to do with Hollywood. He right. was a sophisticated Broadway right. leading man. Uh, he didn't need Hollywood, but they gave him a, a good contract. He went out and he appeared in big broadcast in 1938. Yeah. With, uh, he was you know fifth or sixth on the bill. W.C. Fields was the lead. Dorothy Lamour was in it. Uh, Martha Ray was in it. And, but Bob and, and um, Shirley Ross got the big, big number in the show, which was thanks for the memory. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to look at that scene, and it's on YouTube, you can, it's, it's easy to see, but the, Bob and Shirley Ross singing Thanks for the Memory, you realize what a wonderful song that is, how mm -hmm. much emotion is in mm -hmm. the song. Mm -hmm. They perform it beautifully. It's beautifully directed. And um, that was the scene that made Bob Hope a movie star. And then it became his song. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know. I just knew that if I was watching Johnny Carson <laughs> when I was a kid and Johnny was talking and then suddenly you heard, dun, 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 dun. Right. it meant that Bob Hope was crashing the set right. to make a surprise appearance. Yeah, part of the branding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I didn't even know, I didn't know, I knew that that song just meant that Bob Hope is coming. Right. And I didn't know the, the story behind it or anything. What uh, was also unusual about him was he was one of the great ad-libbers. He was an incredible ad-libber. He had prepared jokes, but he was also, and I guess he learned that from vaudeville as well. Yeah, he, people, uh, yeah, he used writers. Oh, was Bob, people asked me, was Bob Hope really funny? Uh, you know, or was he a guy who could just read jokes? Oh, he was funny. People, writers who worked for him, Larry Gelbart, for example, said Bob Hope was, was funnier in person than any of his monologues. I mean, he really was, a fun guy to be with. He just had a natural wit, um, and I, I. You could see it sometimes in you know the TV shows and radio too, where you know they had flubs on the air. Bob was so quick. He really. Some of them got to be a little, you know, sometimes planned almost. Yes, but, right, right. But uh, you, you could see the ones that weren't, and how how smooth Bob is and how quick he is. So I think um, he was he was a very funny guy. He didn't need the writers. Um, I love the song. The great thing about the song, Bob credit him also with instantly recognizing that song, that he would make that song his own. It became, 
that's the greatest theme song in show business history. Yeah. It's adaptable to every situation. You know, yeah. every place he went, he rewrote the lyrics for that, you know, for-, for That's uh, true. I've seen a lot of specials he did where he rewrote the lyrics for that event that he was at or that special that he was doing or who he was standing out there with. Absolutely. And I got to say, I'm sure more lyrics have been written for that song than any other song in uh, show business history. You know, it's funny. He was this, he's enigmatic. He's this, uh, he was incredibly popular. One of the most popular stars of the 20th century, kind of the American comedian for decades. And yet he also had, which might be common with a lot of comedians, uh, he was a hard nut to crack. He he had this slick exterior and you weren't gonna get inside. You weren't going to find out too much. And I had a personal experience when I was a writer on The Simpsons and Johnny Carson had just gone into retirement. He'd been retired for about a year at that point. He agreed to do a voice on The Simpsons. And so I was one of the writers that was there. This was about a year before I did my own late night show. And he came in and we just couldn't believe it. And Johnny Carson came in, I'll never forget, he had a file of facts and two fresh packets of cigarettes. And he came in and he sat down and he recorded his voice. And then he was a little stiff and nervous at first, but then he really relaxed. And I could see that he, he was around some writers and he liked being around these young writers. And so he just started to, I remember we, he was gonna sign some uh, autographs, a stack of autographs. And he was doing it and he started chatting with us and he started talking about Bob Hope. And it was clear that he loved, he admired Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. but I'll never forget this. He sort of said, you know, he started to confess. I tried over the years, you know, to get him to open up. He'd come on the show and I'd yeah. say, you've known every president since Hoover. Yeah. You've entertained for, you know, you've been, you knew Patton, you were in World War II. And he would always go, yeah, how about that? Yeah. How about that? Yeah. And, Car and, and Carson as an interviewer, and, and I can relate to this now after 23 years, you get someone out there and you're trying to get them to open up a little bit and they're just, yeah, isn't that something? Yeah. Isn't that something? I could see that he would be, mm -hmm. he's a huge star and he'd come on and he'd you know, probably plug what special he was doing, yep. but he wasn't about to open up. No. He, it was a performance for him. He, he came on, his writers would write him a few jokes, he'd have them prepared. And Johnny, Johnny really did not, by the end, did, did not enjoy Bob Hope as a guest. He, it was too frustrating for him. Some. What constrained, I think, Johnny, it probably was the only person that Johnny had to be completely deferential to. Yeah, well, that was. Because here is the, you know, here is the iconic Bob Hope, the NBC, you right. know, uh, the king of NBC for 30 years. And Johnny knew that I have to take care of him. I have yeah. to, but I can't, it's not like Buddy Hackett. It's not like the two of us are going to just be laughing our asses off together. Yeah. We're, uh, I, I need to take care of him and, yeah. and service this guest. And plus, I mean, he was in the later years, he was getting hard of hearing. It was, it was tough to, to really, yeah, to crack Bob Hope. It was tough for anybody, it, it, people besides Johnny Carson. He, I, I didn't find many people who felt that they were close to Bob Hope. I mean, he, he didn't have really close friends. This, I, this, he, is, he, this is interesting because it leads me to want to ask about Bing Crosby. You watch these two together in all these movies that are so iconic and they're so good together and they're just peanut butter and jelly. I mean, just perfect. Like these two should be working together. And even as, I don't wanna say sophisticated, but I know, I feel like I can't be, uh, you know, I can look at people together on screen and they can look like they get along, but I can assume they don't. I swear to you when I watch these road pictures that, that Bing Crosby and Bob Hope are best friends in real life. And they weren't. No, they, they weren't. I, I think it was, a, it was a mixed relationship. I think they did love working together and I think they had a lot of respect for each other, but they were such different kinds of people. Bob was, you know, very social, loved being a star, loved dealing with fans and everything. Bing was much more reclusive, I think much more ambivalent about his fame. Mm -hmm. He moved to, you know, out of, he didn't like the Hollywood scene. He moved to Northern California halfway through his career. And, uh, and he didn't show up for things. Uh, there was a famous uh, Friars Club roast for Bob in the late 40s and all the big stars and comedy stars of Hollywood were there on the dais. 
I mean, Jack Benny, George Burns, Georgie Jessel, the, the whole mm-hmm. gang. And there was a seat for Bing. Bing didn't show up. And I think that rankled Bob. And then um, someone told me, uh, who worked with him late in life, um, that, uh, that Bob said in a, in a candid moment, uh, you know, I never liked Bing. He was, he never, in all the years, he, in, he, in, um, he never invited me and Dolores to dinner. <laughs> yeah. That's an odd thing to hear from. Now, you know, I think he, you know, I think they were, they were friends, but they were not that close and they were very different kind of people. Yeah, I think there was also Bing. It almost felt like everything, uh, he had been a much bigger star earlier than Bob Hope. Right, Bob looked up to Bing a lot. Bob yeah. modeled himself after Bing. I mean, he, uh, when he started, he, he followed Bing into business ventures. Bing mm-hmm. wanted to get into oil, said we got it, you know, and, and Bob, Bob got into oil with Bing. Bob, uh, Bob set up his production company uh, when he set up his own production company in the mid 40s. It was kind of modeled after one that Bing had set up too. So he, he admired, you know, Bing was a very smart businessman. Made and a Bing lot of money was too. very smart about California real estate, I think. Wasn't yeah, that? well, Bob got, Bob, but that's one place where Bob outstripped Bing yeah. because he started buying real estate uh, up in the late 40s and a lot in the 50s. Uh, all the San Fernando Valley real estate when it was cheap, and he at one time was reputed to be the biggest private landholder in the state of California. Right. He uh, he and and got very wealthy because of that. Uh, the the real estate, and so Bob Bob really uh, was very smart about real estate, and he was he would go out and he would look at the property himself. He didn't just have some business associate go out and buy stuff. He went, he, he was very hands on as a, as a businessman. And, huh? and, and, and at one time, I think it was 1968, Fortune Magazine did a uh, survey of the richest people in America. And Bob Hope was the richest person in, in Hollywood, in, in California, richer than any studio mogul. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like being on that list. That's right. It was the one thing he hated to talk, unlike some other people today, uh, he didn't like being known as a rich guy. He, 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 didn't, he felt it separated him from the com, his audience. And so he, he always poo-pooed. He always thought the estimates of his wealth were, oh, and that's way too much, that's way too much. No, he actually wrote and asked for like a retraction. Yeah. You know, I'm not worth what that's you said right. I'm worth. That's I'm right. not worth 800 million, I'm more, you that's know. Right. And, and I think he got them to adjust it somewhat, even though to yeah. most people yeah. in any era, the difference between 800 and 300, yeah. who cares? Right. Uh, it's astronomical. What he didn't, and this is classic for people that grew up in poverty, he, uh, I always heard rumors in my years in show business, you know, when he was still alive, I would hear rumors, I'd run into people who would say, oh, they had worked with, you know, they ran a radio station or a group of radio stations and they had a thing, they arranged for uh, Bob Hope to come and do something and so they were gonna pay him for his transportation, but then Bob got a ride on someone's, you know, on a mogul's jet. Yeah. And so they didn't send the tickets and Bob's people would call and say, send the tickets, because we're gonna cash them in. Yeah. <laughs> that, that he was kind of famous for, I wanna get paid everything I deserve to get yeah. paid. You can't blame him if someone's grown up in that kind of poverty, but even when he was one of the richest landowners in the United States, mm-hmm. there's, I know for a fact, people have told me that they'd see him in the valley going into a fast food restaurant, being assisted, this is very late in his life, mm-hmm. but with coupons. Yeah. Because he has these coupons for the dollar twenty burger that will make it only yeah. 80 cents. Yeah. And he's gonna get that burger. He was, he was cheap. And, and he, would, uh, he would want the receipt from the guy who, you know, his band leader who had to take some music across town, he'd, he'd want the receipt from the cab, you know, uh, to, to, to get repaid. Uh, but that is, that's the depression era mindset. He just, he struggled to make right, it for many right. years and he always had that mindset. One of his writers said, you know, it's, it's for a guy like that, it doesn't matter how much real estate you have, it's what you got in your pocket. And you know, he, it, it was just a hazy number to him what he was worth. It was abstract. Yeah, and what it was, you know, what you could pay for, what you could have, you know, what you had in your pocket. So uh, he was, 
you know, people, a lot of people thought he was cheap. He could also be generous. He, he gave money to, to friends and relatives who needed it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, was very charitable um, and you know, made that part of his image, his, his work for charity and all that, of course. But I think it was an odd thing. You know, he, he could be cheap on the one hand, he could, be, he could dole out $1,000 know, checks on the other. So. He was kind of, uh, you write about it in the book, uh, at one point he owned a lot of land in the Santa Monica Mountains and preservationists wanted yes. him to donate it and they kind of shamed him into donating yeah. it, which I think he resented. Yeah, that was in near the end, you know, in his later years when uh, he had all this land and they were trying to conserve it for, a, for park, park land and he was trying to sell it to developers. He says, I've held this, and, and why not? He said, yeah, I've, yeah. I've had this, uh, I, you know, I, bought, I didn't buy this land, you know, smartly when I, you know, in the 1950s just to give it away. Right. It's appreciated and he wanted to cash it in. He finally did get shamed into at least selling a lot of it for less than market value and, 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 over, and turning it over to the state. A very shrewd businessman, but uh, Walt Disney approached him about investing in his new theme park and Bob Hope said, right. He said, no, I don't think anybody's gonna to go to Anaheim for a place called Disneyland. Yeah. Bob- uh, He wasn't batting a thousand. Bob lived on that story for a while. <laughs> he also claimed that he uh, had a chance to get into Polaroid on the ground floor. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, nah, it's yeah. not gonna work out. Yeah. But well, in the long run, he was right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it just took a while. Uh, he always, he was NBC. He was, uh, worked at NBC for, you know, pretty much his entire career, if not his entire, you know, his yeah. career in radio and then television, and he did the specials and they were hugely successful. And then you got the sense that it, it got to a point when he was getting on in years that NBC needed to be very delicate about this. Maybe the specials aren't rating what they used to, but Bob still wants to do the specials, but you could see that that was getting to be a bit of a tenuous situation yeah. and something that NBC had to, wanted to handle correctly. And yeah. uh, it was not only that the specials, the ratings were going down uh, somewhat. Although interestingly, they held up for a long time. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, even into his eighties, they were still doing, doing well. But uh, it wasn't so much the, as much the ratings as Bob himself was just falling apart or, you know, he was having trouble seeing, he was having trouble hearing. And finally he really couldn't do a monologue even anymore. Uh, so they were starting to construct shows for him that would, you know, would showcase him as as little as possible. Bob presents the new comedians or something, and they, they were, they, you know, uh, very ingeniously coming up with various formats to keep Bob on the air um, while he did less and less. But he didn't want to retire. He just was so addicted to the stage and the applause. And you know, he, he just didn't know what he would do without, it was without his, that. It was his way of life. It's also interesting that he had, he's, you know, you gotta talk about, because you, you talk a lot about this in the book and it's fascinating to me. He marries his, his wife, Dolores, and it feels like they have this great relationship early on. And then there's uh, womanizing. You know, Bob is yeah. kind of a legendary womanizer. Yeah. And, um, and everybody knew it. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. at a time when everybody knew about it. And so Dolores is kind of in the background for a long time. Later in life, it feels like she starts to come back into the foreground. Yeah. I think one of the last things I saw Bob Hope do was a Christmas special. And Dolores is really carrying the ball That's in the right. Christmas special. That's right. And it takes place in their home and these different stars are coming by and it's like, yeah. The actor from Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always the strangest group the of silly, ding yeah. dong. Who is it? And oh, some, hey. Yeah. And some yeah. of Bob's kids are there, and it's the family, and and you know Joey Lawrence. Yes, and Joey Lawrence <laughs> has come by, and hello, Mr. Hope, and they give yeah. a gift. But really, the one carrying all the water is Dolores, because Bob right. is at that point. Yeah. You can tell they're doing a lot of extra pickup shots. That's right. Because and, he couldn't hear very well. That was the big problem. Yeah. So uh, they had to yeah carry him. But uh, yeah, Dolores did start to take control a little bit. I think she tried to convince him to, to not, you know, to, to stop, but she couldn't, you know, she couldn't if he did. To try and get him to stop performing? To stop performing, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and then, then Dolores, of course, uh, started her own, resumed her own singing career. Right. She had been a, a fairly popular nightclub singer back in the 30s when Bob met her and married her. Right. And, uh, uh, and then at the end of, uh, near the end of his life, she picked it up again and she recorded it and, and when she was 80 years old. And then I've seen some footage of them performing together. They had a great routine where she gives him his lyrics and it's, one line, yeah. that tiny little, and he's even in even when he's ninety, he's performing that yeah. really well. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He he's, can still do it. That's right. You're really impressed with how well he's doing it. He's turning over. The, it's just one line, and he's turning over the piece of paper and doing these great takes to the side. And you're like, yeah. oh my god, that guy. That's just not going to go away. Yeah. He uh, interesting with Dolores. He uh, she had been a performer, and then she stopped performing when Bob was riding high, and but she still. For a while, she still would appear on his radio show as a singer. He would always, he would bill her as Dolores Reed. I mean, I, I think I, sometimes he wouldn't even identify her as his wife. Really? Uh, I believe for, you know, for a little bit of time, but then it, he, he would. But then she stopped appearing. But she went with him on, you know, the Vietnam trips. Uh, well, some of the, the, the trips in the 50s and 60s, his trips over, his Christmas yeah. trips, Dolores would go and she would entertain a lot, but she never made it into the show. That when, the, the, that when they'd edit the show together, Dolores was never there. Really? Yeah. Until late, his last Vietnam trip. She went on that trip and then she entertained and he, he used her in the show. And I thought that was sort of symbolic. I think in a sense, Bob didn't want to share the spotlight with his wife. Um, and, and then by the end though, it was, there was some kind of you know reconciliation or or whatever. There are ways that she could really help, yeah. too. Yeah, the, you needed her a little y- more. You know, you brought it up, and it's it's a huge legacy that that Bob Hope has, which is he invented this idea of performing for the troops, the USO. I mean, I'm sure other yeah. people had done some version of it in history, but really Bob Hope made it his own. Mm-hmm. And what's really surprised me in the book is I always pictured him you know, 200 miles from the front line doing a giant show. I had no idea, especially in World War II, yeah. how close to the action he was, yeah. how hard that, how difficult that was. And I mean, uh, there, there is, he's in bombing raids where yeah. he and the other performers are like huddled in a, in a basement yeah. and the bombs are dropping really close. Yeah. Um, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've uh, done, USO work and never been in the slightest, slightest bit of danger. And then I re- read about what he was doing yeah. and realizing he's pretty much on the front line. Yeah. And in some of these World War II uh, performing situations, he it seems feels very improvised. Like they're dashing from camp to camp and yeah. it would be very easy to get killed or hurt. And you can't even, you know, this was at the time, other people were entertaining, but Bob, uh, was nobody was more intrepid than he was. He just he worked so hard at it. He went everywhere. He would make five stops in a day. Uh, then he would have his little little troop of performers, and they didn't have an entourage. They did, they weren't, there was almost no film of it. The first trip to Europe in 1943, right? Because they didn't have a camera crew with them. They were just going and entertaining, and they were in um, North Africa, and then. Um, three days after General Patton uh, succeeded in uh, retaking Sicily uh, for the Allies, Bob Hope, three days later, Bob Hope and his troop were there, uh, as close to the front lines as any American entertainers had ever been. And they were still getting bombing raids from the German, you know, planes, and there were several, you know, air raids, and they had to go into hotel basements, and, or they were in jeeps, and they had to dive for cover. Um, and it, it's harrowing, and it, it was really amazing what he did. Then he, he went also, off. you know, he wasn't doing it. You know, I think in the it changed in the '60s with the Vietnam shows. I think the counterculture was upset about the Vietnam War, and Bob Hope was always preaching, "We want yeah. peace. Uh, we need to unify in this country." And his message wasn't clearly going over well with younger people in the '60s. That's kind of where you feel like they started to part company. Sure. But in World War II and in the Korean War, he's really dedicated in this way that's sweet and inspiring. As you've described it in the book, he means it. 
he's not doing it yeah. for himself or for the glory. He, you get this sense that he really is driven to do this because it's the right thing to do. And you have a story in here about him finishing a big show and finding out that some troops had tried to get in but couldn't and went 30 miles the other way back to their camp. That's and so right. he it took yeah. his people and went 30 yeah. miles and found them yeah. and did a show for them. It's amazing. Which yeah. practically makes me cry, yeah. it's so sweet. Know. Uh, you know, he loved it because, for, it, they were great audiences, they, they yeah. loved him, it, they were easy audiences, but you know, he knew how much it meant to them. I mean, these are guys at the front lines that have just come from battles, maybe they've seen their you know, comrades killed, and, and here's Bob Hope, the biggest comedy star in America, standing in front of them. I mean, you read some of the letters from, from servicemen who watched him and you, you can just feel, you know, how much that meant. And then, and Bob got that and, and it was so meaningful to him. And it was a time, World War II, of course, where there was no controversy about the war. The country right. rallied behind it. There was no, you know, you went over and entertained the troops. You were a patriotic American. Bob, unfortunately, didn't feel, see that the times had changed in Vietnam and you know, he thought he was doing the same thing and he didn't realize quite the depth of the anti-war sentiment. I think the troops in Vietnam still appreciated him. Everyone I talked to who saw him in Vietnam, you know, appreciated, you know, we, we loved seeing Bob Hope. But he started talking about the war, you know, he, he, did, he crossed the line from being a patriot to sort of a partisan. Yeah. He really was talking up the war, we gotta go in and, and, and win the war, and he would badmouth the war prote protesters. Yeah. You know, they're, they're disloyal. He got very friendly with Nixon. Mm -hmm. Nixon uh, used to uh, bring him into the White House for briefings to tell him, uh, Bob, this is why I'm bombing North Vietnam, and expect that Bob would then go out to the country and, and convey the message, which, right. which he did. Uh, it's always good to clear your foreign policy with a comedian. Yeah, I, I know. Find. Well, he see, Nixon realized what a force Bob Hope was in the country. He wanted Bob Hope behind him. You know, it's funny. The big question, the sense you get about Bob Hope is that uh, he had this amazing, this great career, and then it's it feels like he's overstayed his welcome at a certain period of time, which a lot of performers do, and I may be doing now, but you, you, uh, you stick around, he stuck around, and the times changed, and he couldn't stop, and you know, people, we mentioned him already, but Johnny Carson had such a perfect ear for yeah. when, I'm gonna get out now, I'm gonna step yeah. off this incredible achievement, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step off just at this moment, and I'm going to recede and there's gonna be this just reverence, yeah. which I think Bob Hope was almost too visible all the time. He was too available. Yeah. You know, everything started to fall apart. Uh, the, the movies got worse and worse. They got to be kind of a joke. By the, uh, you're talking about the 1960s. Yeah. What do you think, you, you identify his last good movie in here and I can't remember which his one. His last was. good movie was The Facts of Life, yeah. I would say, 1960 with Lucille Ball. Right. It was his favorite co-star and, and he did well with her. That was a nice film, uh, kind of an adult romantic comedy and Bob you know, showed a little bit of range there. And then he started making the Call Me Buanas and I'll Take Sweden's and, and really, pretty crummy, uh, and, and he was walking through them too. The, to, to look at a Bob Hope performance from the 60s versus one from the early 40s, oh, there's such a difference in the performer. Not just he's a little paunchier and older, but the, the, the commitment to the role in the early 40s, I mean, he was into it. He, yeah. everything was heightened you know, to, the, to, the, to the max. And in the 60s, he's kind of just walking through, rattling off the lines. And one of his directors said, you know, he, he doesn't, he comes in and he doesn't know his lines. It, sometimes I, I think he hasn't even read the script, you know. Yeah. Uh, and there was one director of one of his films who said he, uh, he would purposely um, try to reshoot scenes, like for, pretend like there was a technical flaw. Oh, you gotta do it again, Bob. Because by the sixth or seventh time, Bob would have finally <laughs> memorized the Figured lines. out his lines. Yeah. But uh, up until then, it's the light wasn't quite right. Yeah. I, so yeah. there was, and, and, the, and then on the TV, the cue card reading got to be more uh, uh, obvious. And so Bob was kind of walking through it. Uh, and then the times changed and that kind of, that style of comedy, that 
that great American unifying comedian who everybody listens to, you know, that was fine in the 40s and 50s and, you know, even into the early 60s. But by the end of the 60s, no, he was a divisive figure. And, yeah. you know, maybe there was, he outlived the period when you could have one great, all, you know, all-inclusive uh, comedian. He toured relentlessly and worked relentlessly. Uh, I mean, how he passed away, he was over 100? He was 100, exactly. 100, mm -hmm. okay. So, I mean, I think he was still working until how late? How yeah, well, it was 90, in into his early 90s. He had this big 90th birthday party. Right. At CB, uh, NBC had a big 90th birthday special for him. Three hour special, a lot of stars. It's famously the only time Johnny Carson, after he left his show, Johnny only did one other monologue, stand up comedy monologue, and it was for Bob Hope's birthday. Sure, yeah. And that was the, the last time Johnny did a stand up comedy monologue. Anyway, that was a big show, and I bet you NBC figured, and that will be it. <laughs> that will be, but no, Bob wanted to keep going, and so they kept going for a few year, more years. Didn't they then, didn't he, how did it end with NBC? Well, then finally, I think they had some very quiet discussions with the family and with Bob, and with the help of the family, they finally got Bob to agree to do one last show. And it was in 1996 when Bob would have been 93. Mm -hmm. And it was Tony Danza hosted it. Right. It was Bob Hope laughing with the presidents. And it was tied in with a book that he had just come out with, Bob Hope and the Presidents, just putting together right. these little stories about presidents. And Tony does most of the heavy lifting in the show. And Bob sits there and they do a little interviewing and you can tell it's heavily edited. Right. But then that was it. That was the last special. I have asked that when my time is up, that Tony Danza host. Tony Danza, <laughs> good. And he has agreed. He's going. He's going to do it. Uh, he, you know, I had. I think you know this story, but um, I, when I was writing on The Simpsons, one day, and this just shows you how much the culture had changed. But I want to say it was about 1990. I'm sitting around with all the writers in the writer's room at The Simpsons, and Al Jean, I think, came into the room and said, all right, Bob Hope's agreed to do a tape of voice for us, so who wants to go to his, I need some, uh, you know, two writers to go over to his Toluca Lake home. Toluca Lake? Yeah. It's Toluca Lake. Yeah. Go over to his Toluca Lake home and record Bob Hope's voice. Now, I just thought there'd be a mad scrum of everyone trying to go, Two hands went up, and only two hands, and it was it was myself and Jeff Martin. And both of us are just our hands went yeah. up. Like we get to meet Bob yeah, Hope, yeah. we get to go to Bob Hope's house. Everyone else was kind of like, "No, eh, we're good." Yeah, which I couldn't believe. Yeah. So we drove over, and we were let in, and we were told, "Mr. Hope will be with you in a bit." And we were on our own, and I remembered walking around this paneled library with pictures of. Everybody, yeah. I mean everybody, and bound copies of his scripts. And then looking out the back window and seeing a putting green yeah. in his backyard and just being in awe of the whole thing. And then hearing people coming and it was his daughter who I think served as his kind of producer yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. Linda. Linda and a few other people. And we set up our tech stuff and remembered he could barely hear us. I don't think he could see very well. And got a quick handshake and, oh, oh yeah, all right, all right, what are we doing? And he, a lot of, what, what? And yeah, I, I think getting mad at his daughter and we were getting a little embarrassed. And I thought, we're not seeing the Bob Hope. We're seeing this very old man. And I think I told you this, but I thought, you know, I didn't get my Bob Hope moment. I mm -hmm. just, you know, we recorded his line, which was, I think at one point uh, he's, for reasons that I can't remember, he's hanging off a helicopter rudder. Lisa Simpson's in the car and he shouts up, drop me off at that boat show. <laughs> you know, like he's just, uh, you know, and he's got his golf club and just drop me off at that boat show. I'm gonna go make some money over there. And that was the iconic line we wanted him to say is, yeah. And so he did it. We had him say it a couple of times. I think we had to explain to him what the joke was and he's, all right, you know. And then he's leaving. I thought I didn't get my, my Bob Hope moment. And one of his attendants, this guy came up to him and I heard as Bob Hope was walking out towards the stairwell to go upstairs, he said to him about one of the dogs, Mr. Hope, I'm afraid it's time for 
us to put whatever the dog's name was. It's our time for us to put Bow Wow down. You know, mm-hmm. looks that's I just talked to the vets, time to put Bow Wow down. I mean, mm-hmm. and Bob Hope just went, ah, that's a shame. Better let me tell him. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, like, I got it. I that's mean, it was right. while he was walking that's away. Right. Better let me tell him. And I just had this right. moment of, and I was appreciative. I really yeah. was excited to. Uh, see Bob Hope and be even in a slight, tiny way connected to that amazing Mm -hmm. history. And I think that was 1990. He went on to live quite a while after that. He did the last few years, he was kind of out of it. But but he he worked till 93, 94. Uh, Bill Clinton told me a story about playing golf with Bob Hope. When Clinton was in, there was a a famous, uh, edition of the Hope Classic in Palm Springs, the golf tournament, where three presidents played with Bob Hope in a foursome, uh, Ford, Bush Sr., and, and Clinton. And not long after that, um, uh, Bill Clinton is in the White House and gets a call from Bob Hope, or his assistant, I mm-hmm. presume. Um, Bob wants to know if, if, if you can play golf this afternoon, <laughs> the president wow. of the United States. And Clinton said, uh, you know, I actually had some time on my schedule. He booked uh, the, the closest course to the White House, wherever it is, in Virginia somewhere, uh, went over and played golf with Bob Hope for nine holes. He said, this is a guy, he was 91 or something at the time. He could barely see the ball. You could not see where he, the, his assistant had to line him up, you know, and he, he tells me about, there was a three, a three par um, uh, hole that was tough and Bob Clinton, who has a great memory, was telling mm-hmm. me exactly how the hole was and there was a slope to the right and you had to drive. And Hope gets on there and he drives onto the green uh, 20 feet from the pin. Uh, they walk up to the green. The assistant lines up Bob for the putt. Clinton says, I tell him, Bob, it's 20 feet. It's slightly uphill with a break to the right. Okay. He can't see. He putts the ball two feet, two inches from the, from oh, the wow. cup. Uh, taps it in for a par. He said, that's pretty amazing. At that's 90, incredible. 92, 91 or two. So, What do you, what do you think, uh, obviously we, we live in this world now of there's 10,000 comedic voices out there and you know, comics pro, you know, crop up, they're gone. I sometimes don't know how, much, you know how much thought there is about the history of comedy or what came before us. I wonder, and you might be able to shed some light on it, was what, what will the legacy of Bob Hope be? Or is there even such a thing in comedy? Well, you know, when people ask me why I wrote this book, it's, it's partly because I had done another book on stand-up comedy in the 70s, the, the, the George Carlin, Richard Pryor era. Mm-hmm. And when, talking to all those guys down through Jerry Seinfeld, and, and nobody ever mentioned Bob Hope. It just seemed he's so off the radar. So I, 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 you know, I felt he was not properly appreciate. That's why I wrote the book. I felt like I was on a mission. What's his legacy? I mean, people have to go back. Today, you're right. His comedy is not what people do think of as stand-up comedy today. Today, right. uh, it's, it's a different style. And you listen to some of those early radio shows. It's pretty corny stuff. I mean, Bob mm-hmm. Hope's monologues. It, it'd be hard to sort of pull out lines and say, what a great line that was. But he was a comedian of the time and as I say, innovators, we have to respect the innovators who, who, you know, in their time, discover something new. And Bob Hope discovered something new. He, he discovered that topical monologue. And he, uh, he also discovered what I think his legacy is, almost as much for what he did off screen as on screen. I think the way he sort of conducted himself as a celebrity, he was, he was a guy who had a, had a role on the public stage you know, he, mm-hmm. w- he was a star who, who did public service, who entertained the troops, who worked for charity. He said, I, th- I think he said to, you know, by example, he said to his fellow Hollywood stars, you're, famous, you're a famous Hollywood star. You have an obligation to do more than just make movies and sign autographs and buy a fancy home in Malibu. You have an obligation to use your celebrity to do good, to give mm-hmm. back in some sense, uh, to have a role on the public stage. So I, I think the whole generation of, uh, current generation of activist Hollywood stars, George Clooney, uh, Angelina Jolie, et cetera, I think they owe a, a debt to Bob Hope. I mean, he made it safe for stars to be taken seriously as public figures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the political views are different, the causes are different, 
But, you know, he made it, he, he paved the way. So that's, I think, a big part of his legacy. Yeah, he was, uh, I mean, even uh, his, I think about this when, when I first went to entertain troops, I obviously went and looked at, well, what did Bob Hope do? Because mm-hmm. there's gotta be, and sure enough, it's all, he, he tells you what to do through example, which is prepare. Mm-hmm. Know what you're getting into, do your research, do some reconnaissance and find out mm-hmm. uh, what are the, you know, who's the base commander, who, right. you know, the Marines, the, who do they like to laugh at? Well, they like to laugh at, you know, the different branches, right. wh- what's their take on each other and right. know that. So if you're talking to the Navy, you know to make fun right. of the Army. If you're talking to the Army, you make fun of the Navy. And uh, I-, I was really impressed with how much, and it's in, the, it's in your book, how much reconnaissance he did. He yeah. really knew, he worked really hard so that when he entertained the troops on those bases, it was a personal experience. Exactly. He was making jokes where he told them, I understand what your life is like. Right. I know your base commander's a tight ass. Right. I know that the food stinks. And yeah. he would get specifics. Right. And exactly. uh, then he could bring out Raquel Welch. That's which right. always a good idea. He really felt, they, they felt he was talking their language. And he, was fam- he would send those riders out uh, a few days before and they would, they would find out what the buzz on the, on the base was. He did it in his, all his concerts. If he was going to St. Louis, he would find out what the mayor, you know, what, what the latest scandal was. And he'd yeah. make a joke about the mayor or the local you know, restaurant or whatever. Uh, so everybody, it was amazing to read through his fan mail. Um, you know, he got a ton of fan mail. I, I don't, it's hard to know, but I bet he got more fan mail than any, anybody. And it was amazing how much he answered. Mm -hmm. He answered, uh, and he certainly had assistants who were writing it up. Uh, But I saw all these in his his, uh, massive uh, boxes full of letters that are at the Library of Congress now. And it was, you you knew that a secretary was typing this up, but so many of these letters had a personal response. Yeah, 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 I remember uh, Toledo, that uh, I played the uh, Hippodrome Theater in 19, you know, things like that, that he had to be dictating these He had to physically be there and and And, connecting, yeah. That's right, and every person who got a letter back from Bob Hope like that, you know, there there was a fan for life. He was the greatest grassroots politician for, uh, of any entertainer, I think. In his and he never life. considered politics? He, no, you know. he didn't. I think uh, there was a time when some people were kind of talking, Bob, you ought to write yeah. in, the, in the late 60s. Uh, but uh, he, he, I don't think he really wanted no. to get into politics. He, didn't. No. he resisted that. There's no money in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this book is uh, a real pleasure and I'm so glad you wrote it. I'm so glad that I, this sounds apocryphal, but it's, this is an absolutely true story. When I first came out to Los Angeles in 1985, my writing partner, Greg Daniels, and I had our first meeting where we were gonna get a job and they handed us a contract they wanted us to sign. And before we signed it, Greg and I went back to our little apartment on Barrington in uh, Brentwood and we were studying this contract in it. we had never seen a contract before and it said acts of God and, you know, yeah. all the different boilerplate that's in there. And we came back and we were ready to sign. And we said, we'd like to put a Bob Hope clause in there. And uh, I remember at our agent at the time said, what are you talking about? And I said, we just want one thing in there that says, should Bob Hope die during the course of, during the time uh, of this contract, that uh, it's void. <laughs> because uh, he's been such a big part of the comedy landscape that all the rules will no longer exist. <laughs> and of course we were half kidding, but we remember us pushing this agent on the Bob Hope clause in 1985. He's like, shut the f- up, <laughs> you kids. We, it was our first job and we were being wise asses, but I wanna say half of it kind of felt true. Like mm-hmm. Bob Hope had such, had so much been the complete background and yeah. he had been such a big part and such an institutional figure that we thought, can we get this one clause in there where the f- for some reason, something crazy happens to Bob Hope in the next month, this is all off. Well, we didn't uh, get it. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that I, I, I really felt a sense of mission about writing the book, and I'm glad that people like you, because there are not that many who will, uh, comedians out there who will, who will talk so fondly about Bob Hope, and they should. They should. This is the guy who invented their art form. I yeah. Feel. Well, to fix that, 
um, I will implore and demand uh, that this is, this is not a homework assignment. It's just a great book. It is a page turner. And it's not just, this is not just a book about a guy named Bob Hope. I think to a large degree, this is a book about the 20th century in America. It is, it takes you through, when you think about the span of time that Bob Hope lived through, he lives through vaudeville, mm -hmm. the explosion of radio, movies, television, and he, his life ended not long ago. I mean, and he encompasses pretty much, I mean, everything except for the internet. Yeah. That's everything. And if you, if you wanna get all of that, the experience of show business, you have to read this book. Uh, Hope uh, is, is out there. Richard Zoglin, thank you so much thank for uh, writing the book and then for agreeing to uh, talk to me about it in this very creepy room. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, let's see the room. I had this measured so that I could reach over yeah. and shake people's hands. You can't do that on Charlie Rose. <laughs> You're not allowed to touch him because he's not really there. All right, this is Conan O'Brien. If you want to check out other jibber jabbers, go to teamcoco.com and then press Alt-Delete 9. That last part I made up. <laughs> Just find jibber jabber. There's a lot of great interviews and uh, these are labors of love. These are only people I really want to talk to about books and things that really excite me. So thank you so much. Very nice, thanks. <laughs>